Recording by Barbara Dirksen Abandoned by William Clark Russell Chapter 6 The Fisherman When Reynolds again opened his eyes, the day was broad, brilliant, and noisy. He got out of the fissure which had supplied him with a sheltered, moss-coated couch, and immediately made his way to a rise of ground to obtain a view of the sea. He swept the horizon with the practiced gaze of a sailor, observing in his wounded eye a little dimness of vision. Nothing that could be named a ship was in sight. Large dark clouds were sailing with the wind, but above them was a ceiling of mother of pearl that was settling slowly westwards. A fresh breeze was blowing. The sea was alive and leaping. On the shoal the water was the glaring whiteness of wrestling waves. The blow of the surge on the southeast side boomed with the deep note of heavy guns through the wind. The trees sang and the surf bellowed, and the full and spacious scene from dome to liquid floor throbbed and shouted and danced and roared with the spirit of ocean liberty. Reynolds walked towards the foam heap at the foot of the cataract and drank, then, stripping himself, plunged into the bright water of the little river, which was as sweet as honey for the distance of a half a cable, with the force of the current that was rushed through the foam mound by those waterfalls, when it grew brackish and rapidly passed into salt water. He was much refreshed by his bath, and ran to and fro to dry himself, and when he had put on his clothes, he walked to the sand and got upon the rock to breakfast. He ate heartily, for these were very fat and choice oysters, though big, and for condiment they needed neither vinegar nor pepper, but the contents of the best of all cruet stands, which he had, that is, appetite. Whilst he was thus occupied, he saw swimming deep in the green crystal space of water betwixt the rock and the shore, where the creek began to widen, a number of big fish, of which he had before taken notice. He judged by their bulk that they would weigh from eight to thirty pounds. If they were not rock-cod, they resembled that fish, but some were of a different species, and they were gay with colors and shaped like perch. Reynolds saw abundance of food beneath him, but how was he to get it? He was without hook or line, though there was plenty of bait in the thousands of limpets which adhered to this and other rocks. He recollected that a naval officer who was in a surveying ship off Patagonia had told him that the longshore natives of that country took fish in this way. They fashioned lines out of tendrils of shrubbery. To the end of a line they attached a limpet. This they dropped over the edge of their canoe. The fish gorged the limpet and was warily drawn to the surface by the fisherman, who then dexterously passed his hand under the fish and tossed it out of the water into the boat. This memory determined Reynolds to try his hand. He was a sailor and the possessor of a knife and burning glass, and thus equipped he could not be at a loss. But as he never could be in want of food whilst oysters and other shellfish abounded, he resolved first to explore the island and to climb its highest point, which was a hill several hundred feet high, that hill from whose steeps the cataracts blew their trumpets. It must be his business to prepare the means of making a smoke should a sail heave into view. He wished to catch a sight of himself to judge of the extent of the injuries to his face. But there was no pool of water that was not blurred by the hurrying fingers of the wind. He got upon the shore and set out upon his adventures. This little principality was but a mile long, as you have heard, and three-quarters of a mile wide, and it was to be compassed and examined without much fatigue of walking. He climbed the hill and gained the summit, and the island lay below him in green and brown and grey, 
tender with verdure, and splendid with its mighty dazzle of foam on the southeast side, and the brilliant cream of the surf that roared upon its coral strand from north to right, around by west to south. It blew fresh up there where he was, and the salt song shrilled past his ears as though he was aloft in a squall on a top gallant yard. There was a hollow a short distance down, and in that hollow he determined to collect the materials for a fire. But he was compelled to make many journeys before his heat for burning was collected and sufficient. There was no wood fit for his purpose on the hill. He cut and hacked with his knife, and painfully ascended with his arms full. But he did not cease in his toil until his work was ended, and then he sat down on the top of the hill to rest and muse and survey the sea line. He asked himself, What is my chance of escape? The island was far out of the track of steamers bound north or south. Nothing was likely to come that way but a ship blown out of her course, or a whaler to whom this island might be known for the purity and value of its fresh water. He had again and again looked at his chart before the shipwreck, and memory submitted a clear map of his situation to him. He understood with a sense of dismay that grew into consternation as he realized the magnitude of his ocean loneliness that weeks, that months, nay, that even years might pass and find him, if alive, a captive on this shore. The weight of a reflection so enormous was crushing, and he said to himself, Oh, my great God, it may happen as I fear. And again his heart was rent by an insupportable pang of yearning for one, but for one companion only to speak to. This passionate desire caused him to scrutinize the coast and foreshore of which he commanded the whole extent from where he sat, but he could not perceive the least signs of wreckage or anything resembling a stranded human body. His spirits were so sunk that he found no heart to make grass lines for fishing that day, and until he laid himself down in the cleft in the side of the dell he rambled aimlessly here and there, often sending a forlorn gaze seawards, sometimes sitting with his head bowed upon his folded arms, sometimes going to the river for a drink of water, twice to his rock for oysters. He looked at the trees for fruit, but saw none. Here on this island was vegetation that he had met with in other parts of the world. Some flowers, one of which he plucked, but it was without smell, though he afterwards discovered that this flower blew a very sweet perfume at nightfall and through the darkness, and likewise when the moon whitened the scene. The several growths were more or less familiar to him, for in his time Reynolds had visited many different parts of the globe, but in respect of knowledge, he was like the boy who, in speaking of the letters of the alphabet, told the schoolmaster that he knew them by their faces, but not by their names. Next morning, which was another windy, sparkling, singing day, much like that which was gone, he fell to his task of making fishing lines after he had bathed and breakfasted. He cut some long grass and plaited it, but found that when it was in six or eight strands it broke easily. He strolled to some of the trees, conceiving he might meet with some wide-like tendrils, and sure enough he discovered, coiled round the trunks of several dwarf trees in a little bit of wood near the dell, a parasitic growth of the thickness of the thong of a coach-whip and as strong. He cut away one and uncoiled its embrace and found himself equipped with a supple fishing line between eight and ten feet long, strong enough to have hanged him with. He was pondering how he should attach a limpet to the end of this creeper, 
when his eye was taken by a little collection of bush, in the midst of which he seemed to see a sort of darkness. He approached the bushes and found himself looking into the mouth of a cave. The aperture was scarcely obstructed by the growth which stood thick on either hand, leaving the mouth a sort of blackness when viewed from a distance. The entrance was a little more than the height of a man. Though a natural formation, the roof of the opening stood out from the slope of the land as though the invention of human labor. Reynolds went close and peered in, and as he stared, a large sea bird came sailing out. It looked like a ghost as it grew out of its own glimmering, and it hit Reynolds over the face with its wing. It would have knocked his cap off had he been covered. He started back in terror. The apparition was sudden and unexpected, and at the instant frightful to the man whose nerves were very low. But when following the thing with his eye, he perceived that it was a very large kind of seagull, white and gray in feathers, seemingly sick, for its flight was languid and it sank upon the ground after a short excursion. His spirits rallied, and again. He peered into the cave. He entered by several paces, and then stood stock still, awaiting the passage of another sea bird, for this might be a kind of hospital for decayed ocean fowl. And then, his eyes growing used to the shadow, he found himself in a natural cavern running back from its mouth about twenty feet, sloping low at the extremity, so as to oblige one who went there to crouch. But in the middle part, tall enough to stand under, the walls about eight feet apart. As his vision grew educated to the gloom, objects shaped themselves within its horizon, and he judged that this in its day had been the haunt of one man or more. The floor was hard and sandy, with a little dim sheen on it, as though it was bestrewn with grit which possessed a property of shining. On the left hand side stood an old fashioned sea chest. Close against it, resting against the wall, was a shovel of a very elderly pattern. Upon the ground were a musket and a carpenter's axe. Reynolds went to the chest and found it locked. He picked up the axe and, forcing the sharp corner of the cutting part betwixt the lid and the side, he prized the lid open. Indeed, it was something rotten, and not only did the wood split and yield very easily, but the metal of the lock and the screws and nails about it showed like old teeth, grinning and rusty. The chest was furnished with a shelf in which he found a brass tobacco box, some clay pipes, three spade guineas, and a few five shilling pieces and some shillings. About three pounds of leaf tobacco bound in canvas and twine, a coil of copper wire, a roll of yellowing paper, and a flat pencil. In the chest were two pairs of cloth knee breeches, several pairs of coarse grey stockings, two pairs of buckle shoes, two waistcoats, one coat, and a cloak with a chain to connect it at the throat. He judged the date of this apparel to be about eighteen hundred. On the lid of the chest were chiselled deep two letters L B. He looked about him for the remains of a man in the shape of human bones. Nothing in that way was to be seen. It was clear from the state of the chest that the cave had not been entered since the departure of the man or men who had used it. He conjectured that the furniture illustrated a story of shipwreck. Some men had come ashore from a foundered craft, bringing with them the sea chest, the shovel, axe, and musket. Whether they had been taken off, or whether they had perished or rotted out of being on this island, was not to be gathered from their dumb memorials, and yet it. Warmed Reynolds with a little heat of cheerfulness to reflect that others had been here before him.
the sense of previous life, though charged as that life might have been with dire suffering and a miserable ending, humanized the island. He again scrutinized this interior for signs of human remains, and then stepped out into the daylight, bearing with him the creeper he had cut from the tree. It is difficult to imagine any scene of human life more interesting than the spectacle of a man suddenly flung by some such stress of destiny as shipwreck from all the resources of civilization into the obligation of living as though he was something primordial, dwelling in a time that he knew not the plow, nor the blacksmith, nor the shop which calls itself stores. A man is cast almost naked upon an island coast. He is alone, a Caruso, a Selkirk. How shall he feed and clothe and shelter himself? His needs must fire his ingenuity. The mongrel dog knows as well as the two-legged customer the butchers of the town, and lives by snatching. A hungry, half-stripped man deals with nature as the mongrel with the butcher. He scrutinizes her, not in admiration of her divine skill, but for what he can steal from her to eat. Whether a princely nobleman would, as a castaway, suffer equally with a sweep in a like situation, might depend upon the state of his health. It would be true, perhaps, if it be said that we should take more interest in the struggles of his grace to find a breakfast on a rock, or a supper in a tree, than in the labors of a man whom a bloater and a potato are a banquet. Outside the cave, Reynolds fell to considering his fishing line, and how he was to bait it with a limpet. And whilst he reflected, he constantly sent looks at the horizon— for at any moment the white star of a sail or the stain of a steamer's smoke might break the continuity of that everlasting girdle. Suddenly it entered his head to use the copper wire in the sea chest. He re-entered the cave and took the wire from its shelf, brought a guinea to the cavern's mouth to examine it, went back and picked up some of the clothes and carried them out into the light. They were perhaps a hundred years old, and almost rotten save the cloak, which, being made of some strong-ribbed material like corduroy, seemed as stout and promised to be as useful as though it was fresh from the sign of the board and shears. He left the clothes on the ground as worthless to him, and by the help of the axe he struck a nail from the ripped lock of the sea-chest and hammered it into the side of the cave and hung up the cloak. He brought the little parcel of tobacco to the light and cut it open, but the leaves within crumbled to powder when he touched them, and he threw the stuff away. Now, drawing forth the copper wire, he cut off a piece and passed it through the end of the creeper, turning it up into the shape of a hook, and thus armed, he made his way to the rock." This business occupied his mind and kept him a little away from melancholy. He took his meteorite, which lay on the shore near the rock, and struck at some limpets. These creatures adhere with so much tenacity that to detach one you must strike with a force of sixty-two pounds, that is to say, close upon two thousand times its own weight. He baited his strange fishing line and dropped it into the water. In a few moments a fish of about ten pounds floated up and swallowed the bait, and then Reynolds perceived that he had calculated a miss. He brought the fish to the surface, but when he tried to land it he drew the bait out of the creature's throat, and perceived, unless Patagonian-wise, he could pass his hand or something else under the fish, his angling would be little more than a tickling." He must make a net stout enough to lift the fish on to the rock. He regained the island, leaving his line and the cucumber-shaped stone on the shore opposite the rock, and walked inland with many a glance at the horizon. He easily understood what to do. He selected two boughs and curved them into a hoop 
binding them with strong fibres of creepers. He then cut another bow for a handle, and this he skilfully secured to the hoop by cleaving one end of the stick and fitting the hoop into it, and securely binding it. He chose fibres of creepers for a mash, and, cutting as much as he needed, sat down in the shadow of a tree and began to weave. It was now past noon. The sun was high and shone with great splendour upon the sea, which was full of the life of the fresh breeze. The booming of the surf was like the roaring of a city heard from a church top. The sea birds slanted and curved in lovely flight, and the waterfalls sparkled like quicksilver into the glory of foam at their foot. From time to time he would remit the diligent plying of his fingers to look seawards, and then around him. It was a kind of toil that suffered plenty of room for thought. His fancies flowed to his wife, and he said to himself, Supposing she had consented to stay with me, and she had been saved with me only, and we two had found ourselves alone upon this island, how strange it would have been! How would I have cherished her? What delight should I have found in this imprisonment in providing for her once? So that hereafter, should it have ever come to our being rescued, we should both recall this island as a happy garden, an ocean's gift of a dwelling for us whilst our honeymoon ran. He sighed, and his hand sank, and for some minutes he sat motionless with his eyes fixed upon the grass. The tree overhead sang and shivered and scintillated with little suns, and the taller shrubs and bushes were gay, with nods and becks and wreathed smiles, as though there were a minstrelsy in the breeze which made them dance. A great quantity of mushrooms flourished in this island. Reynolds had peered at the trees for fruit, but it had not occurred to him to look upon the earth for food. His eye lighting on some mushrooms, it struck him that they would be good to eat and supply the absence of bread, and going to them he picked one, and knew enough of the vegetable world to distinguish at once the eatable fungus from the toadstool. He skinned some and eat them with relish. His work of weaving was not half ended when the dusk came. He had often dropped the job to climb a height and scan the sea, to walk to the river to drink, and twice to the rock for oysters. In that part of the world it was the season that corresponds with our July, and extremely warm. Indeed, the sun bit with a fang of fire, but the shadows cast by the trees were deliciously fanned by the fresh wind. Another night had come. He had no mind to occupy the cave. He was a sailor, accustomed to the wide freedom of the sea, and the idea of the natural bed in the dell, over which sparkled the firmament, pleased him better than the thought of the cave, which was a sort of sepulchre to his imagination, with its mute memorials of human life which had passed. He, however, entered it to fetch the cloak, which he spread on the floor of the fissure, and it made him, with the moss beneath, a softer couch than many he had dreamed deeply on at sea. Next morning, after bathing and breakfasting as before, he went to work again upon his landing net, which he completed in the early afternoon. Already the spirit of solitude was doing its work in him. His beard and moustache had sprouted, and accented a melancholy shadow in the hollows under his cheekbones. He was bareheaded, and his hair lay wild. The wounds at the corner of his mouth and eye had healed. He was sensible that the sight of his left eye was affected, but he could not have imagined how great was the structural change in his face in consequence of the injuries. To be sure, when his moustache grew, the disfigurement at the corner of the mouth would be concealed, but the real transformation lay in the left side of his face, 
owing to distortion of the eyebrow and to a new expression of the eye drawn by the pencils of the healed flesh. He had looked into some pools of water here and there, but in no silent surface even could he find an adequate portrait. The misery of his situation had already wrought in him and was strangely visible in the infixed sadness of his looks. But it was not only his shipwreck, his being a lamentable castaway, his being so alone that if he had been that last man described by the poet Campbell, he could not have been lonelier. There was memory to yellow and skeletonize what had otherwise been the green leaves of his mind. Even as he sat making his landing net, he would think of his wife and wonder why she had forsaken him, whether through some perversion of brain she had, when standing before the altar, conceived something in him, a quality of mind, a characteristic of person that had suddenly excited in her a deep and abiding loathing. Then, too, he mourned the death of his friend Featherbridge and the shocking tragical extinction of the whole of the ship's company, for men who are cooped up for many long weeks together in a ship will take that colouring of sentiment which the sailor feels when he speaks of a messmate and a shipmate. All those men whom he had commanded, who had sprang readily to his order, who had proved dutiful and an excellent crew, for he was a sailor who knew how to treat sailors, were as clean gone out of life as the cloud that sailed two hours before across the sky. Here were thoughts to put a pang into every heartbeat, a sigh into every respiration. His fish-lifter was a basket rather than a net. He carried it to the rock and baited his line. The fish, unused to the sight of the human figure and ignorant of the human character, exhibited a tameness that would have been as shocking to Reynolds as Cowper thought a like sort of indifference must have proved to Selkirk had he heeded it. They floated in various-sized green and silver shapes beneath him, and scarce was the limpet under the water when a fine fish gorged it. Reynolds softly brought his prey to the surface and then, quickly putting his basket under it, whipped the noble fish on to the rock, a prize of fifteen pounds weight where it sprang and gasped. This was a clever achievement, and Reynolds was sensible of a little heat of triumph. Whilst he watched his victim, he considered how he should cook him. His first idea had been to dig a pit for a furnace, which was now quite easy, as there was a shovel in the cave. Over this pit, he proposed to arch a stout bow and hang by grass a steak of fish over the fire. He foresaw trouble, first because only the lower part of the fish would be baked, and next because the fire was certain to burn the grass lanyard and let the fish fall into the flames. But it now occurred to him to use the shovel for a frying pan. So, full of this business, he took up the fish and carried it to the mainland and walked with it to the cave where he placed it for safety, as he had no mind after his labors to be robbed by those insatiate gentry of the air who were wheeling and curving over the sea by the shore and sometimes over the land. He laid hold of the shovel and saw that it would serve very well indeed as a frying pan after it had dug him an oven. He pulled off his coat and waistcoat and placed them in the cave and began to dig outside and dug with such diligence as though he were a trappist intent on his own grave, that in a very short time he had made a considerable square hole. He took care that it should be well in the sun, as he needed the fire of that luminary for his burning glass. He then collected a quantity of fuel and set fire with his burning glass to some grass as dry as hay, and the fire burnt merrily.' 
With the axe which was in the cave he cut wood into little logs, and presently the hole was glowing, and a delicate blue smoke was soaring and arching over when the wind took it like a feather. He thoroughly cleaned the inside of the shovel, then stepped into the cave and gutted his fish and cut it into stakes, two or three of which he lay in the shovel along with the creature's liver and some slices of mushroom. Next, going to the fire with his shovel thus furnished, he placed his queer frying pan upon the furnace, contriving that it should rest without his support, and with his knife he turned the slices of fish about until one of the goodliest smells he had smelt for a long time passed arose. For here was a fish wonderfully fresh and sweet from its native brine, resembling a cod, though the flesh looked like turbot. It was a real treat to the poor fellow, whose nature loneliness was coloring with a childlike simplicity, insomuch that presently he would be finding a joy in very little things, and a keen distress in trifles, as a prisoner long confined gets to love a spider, and tears his hair when it dies, or as a sailor after a long voyage takes delight or finds trouble in things whose triviality excites the wonder of the people he steps ashore amongst. A number of sea-birds flew in circles over his head whilst he cooked. When the meal was prepared, he plucked a large leaf for a tablecloth, and set a fried steak and mushrooms upon it, and fell to, scarcely missing salt. Maybe the sweat of his toil supplied that seasoning for his appetite. Never had he banqueted more sumptuously, and when he had drank from the river he felt strongly the force and truth of the line, Man wants but little here below even if he should want that little long. This day passed, and the next, and the hours moving into weeks swelled into a month, which was like to prove a twelve-month, and perhaps a lifetime, for all this man could tell. For never once, though he was ever on the watch, did he catch sight of a sail or the shadow of smoke. Constantly he would ascend the hill from the hollow where he had assembled the materials for a fire, and strain his sight until the balls of vision ached. He was now bearded and his mouth concealed by hair. Although no more than a month had passed, he looked as wild, pale, and ragged as any wretched pauper that one meets on a highway, with his skirts and ribbons, and limping in old boots, of which you shall presently meet one left in the middle of the road, discarded forever, an object very fit to muse upon. This brought him into the month of March. One night he had put himself away in his cleft, which he continued to occupy, as his first aversion to sleeping in the cave had by now, by the strain of melancholy that was in his mind, been changed into a sort of superstition, and as a lonesome man he was afraid to rest in that place. The moon was up, and her light shone in a fine silver haze in the dell. The night was still, the trees slumbered. The little white cloud on high lingered as though for the love of the glorious glowing star that gemmed its skirt. But old ocean, perturbed by memories of wreck and ruin, tossed in her dreams and shouted as she drove her liquid shoulders at the island's step, and muttered moodily and hissed her own thoughts on the coral strand. The whiteness and coolness and calmness of the night brought Lucretia into Reynolds' mind, and he remembered his dream as she appeared to him with a light on her brow that froze his heart with lances of ice. He thought of her. Her eyes were a clear liquid dusk, within whose tender horizons admiration witnessed the passions, the sensibilities, the tastes it desired for so fine a figure of a woman. What was the truth? 
Her eyes were altars on which her spirit had placed the cold white lamps of chastity, lights which, like the remote stars, revealed themselves only and warmed and illuminated nothing. He lay thinking of his wife with his eyes upon the moon, which, with a considerable circle of sky over the dell, was visible to him in the position he occupied on that natural shelf. The moon stands as a symbol of purity. Such beautiful women as Lucretia should be viewed by the moonlight only. The moon stands as a symbol of desolation, and the words which Tennyson makes Lucretia use in his reference to the seat of the gods are strangely applicable to our satellite. Where never creeps a cloud or moves a wind, nor ever falls the least white star of snow, nor ever lowest roll of thunder mourns, nor sound of human sorrow mounts to mar its sacred everlasting calm. He fell asleep for about two hours, then opened his eyes, waking suddenly. The dell was still bathed in the moonshine, and he saw the figure of a man who was walking very slowly. Every bush cast its ebony shadow, but the figure of this man was shadowless. He was dressed in a long coat with side skirts of the old-fashioned sort, knee breeches and shoes, and held his hat in his hand. His face in the moonlight was pale and full, and it was without hair. He was bald, with flowing hair falling from the semicircle it made at the back of his head between his ears. Reynolds heart beat hard. He stared, and if that which was perceptible to him had been visible to an onlooker, it would have been difficult for him to decide which was the stranger sight, the face of the living man in that cleft, or the apparition he watched. He took notice again that it was shadowless, whilst at the foot of every bush slept its ebon ghost. He threw his legs over and got out and stood looking at the shape as it walked, approached a step with his heart thundering like the swell against the cliff in his ear, stood still and looked, and found he was alone. Slowly he turned his eyes round the dell. The vision of the brain had vanished. He was awed and terrified. He perfectly understood that what he had beheld was an illusion, and he conceived that it was a sign he was losing his reason. Or could it be that he had dreamt vividly that he had seen a ghost and had left the ledge to watch it, and it had disappeared because he awoke, having quitted his bed in his sleep, with the dream working in his head? He was without superstition. He had never believed in ghosts. He knew that what had stalked in the dell was an imagination, a deceit, a coinage of some brain cell that had mutinied and irresponsibly acted. But for the rest of the night he could not sleep, nor for many days afterwards could he shake off the horror that that vision of the dell was a premonition of madness. Wherein he proved that not then, at all events, was he mad, for he was unwittingly following the logic of Coleridge, who said, If I see a figure enter a room and know that it is unreal, I am not mad. But if I start and believe it real and behave, whether by a cost or by other conduct, as though it were an actual entity, I am mad. The poet's reasoning ran to this effect, not quite in these words. It was certainly very strange that the shape should have been attired in the costume in the sea chest in the cave. Yet it might easily have been that the irresponsible brain cell, in indulging in this freak, would select the garb and figure a presentiment of one who was perhaps the last man who had lived on this island. The months rolled on, and Reynolds remained alone. End of chapter 6